Well, we uh, just kind of wanted, I wanted to review a little bit and then questions kind of come in as we kind of covered the uh, uh, Noah's Ark and the flood uh, last week, uh, some of the things that we uh, didn't mention. So just maybe to cover uh, some of those as well. But again, the the, uh, the flood itself, as we might say, is kind of the decreation of, of the planet. We had the creation of the planet in the opening chapters and in the instructions and information about Adam and so forth. And we're going to get a parallel version of that as the earth now has been, in a sense, we said last week, decreated. It's going to get recreated as they come off of, uh, of the ark. And so the flood is uh, kind of the reversal of the, uh, the opening chapters of Genesis. A couple of things just to uh, remind ourselves is that uh, this idea of the worldwide flood is, is sometimes uh, ridiculed and mocked in, uh, in secular uh, areas of, of life because, as scientists would appropriately say, uh, the moisture in the atmosphere today, if it were all to rain at one time, would cover the earth up into an inch and a half. Therefore, there couldn't have been a worldwide flood. But remember, this was a violent storm. There were, it was cataclysmic. <clears throat> they were on the ark for over a year. The Bible describes uh, the underground caverns of, uh, of the earth and of the ocean uh, opening up. And, uh, and we do know from scientists today, at least their estimates are, that there's over 200 million cubic miles of, of water uh, in the planet. And, uh, and if those caverns were to open up and there were some geological changes, the earth could be covered a mile and a half uh, deep in water. Uh, the Mount Ararat, and we'll see plural, the mountains of Ararat, uh, are located from on the border of Russia, Iran, and Turkey. There's uh, over 65 peaks in the uh, range in elevation up to 17,000 feet. So a difficult place to get to geopolitically uh, and at this point in time, covered by uh, ice and frozen uh, tundra most of the time, only under severe drought conditions. Could anybody even launch an expedition to find the ark, which many have done? It's been considered the fact that there were a lot of uh, uh, changes in the environment because at one time, Josephus says, the Jewish historian writing in the uh, Wars of the Jews, uh, talks about the fact that in his day, the ark was clearly visible. We've got uh, over 120 eyewitness um, documentations of people seeing the ark and, uh, uh, and so forth through history, but uh, most of those uh, were quite a long time ago. Uh, we also mentioned six facts concerning the uh, geological structure and evidence of the earth that all give testimony for a worldwide flood. You've got plant life at very high elevation, tropical growth being frozen in terms of fossils in the Himalayas and, uh, and so forth. All the evidence, geolo evidence geologically points to a worldwide flood. What we didn't talk about was the, uh, the stories that uh, were spread among cultural uh, people groups around the world, of which there are over 270 that describe a worldwide flood, including the Hawaiian culture. The Hawaiian Noah's name was Nu'u, his wife's name was Lili Noe, and um, because of the wickedness of the people, and again, two different versions, one say they built a great canoe with a house on it, or the canoe and the house was given to them by God, but either way, because of the wickedness of the people, according to this Hawaiian cultural story, they enter uh, this uh, canoe, uh, he, his wife, his three sons, and their wives, eight in all, they enter and they are spared from the flood and emerge to repopulate the earth. Of course, if that's true, I guess we're all part Hawaiian, huh? <laughs> but uh, all these people groups around the world all have the same, same story. It's interesting, I was just talking with Kathy, we mentioned Cover Chapel Tokorozawa, where Peter and Melissa are, and um, Pastor Travis, talking to me, he's got a, a little van, not too many people in Japan have a car, and somebody had given them a van and I noticed on the back of it one time, it's, it's, uh, it's like a Nissan or Toyota or whatever. But in Japan, they have these strange models that we just don't have here. I shouldn't say strange. They're just different. Uh, we, we don't always see them. But it's this little minivan, and the name of it is the Ark. And the reason it's called the Ark is because it seats eight passengers. <laughs> so uh, very, very interesting. We have these ideas that, uh, that float around sometimes, and, we're, and uh, many people are probably unaware of where they even come from, but uh, lots of evidence for the worldwide flood. We also talked about the 
The same waters that brought judgment again were the ones that were saved Noah and that he was saved by faith. And we quoted from Hebrews 11:7 that make that very clear uh, and really establish very early on this idea that it's by God's grace, it's our faith and, uh, and what he's done for us and his promises and his grace that saves us. And certainly that continues as we get to the life of uh, Abraham. Uh, Moses, again, uh, we talked about his literary style, very careful in writing this and how he writes uh, uh, in a literary style where he gives us a mirror image and then reverses it going the other way in this large section of, uh, of Genesis. In other words, he, uh, Noah uh, builds, builds the ark uh, and we're going to see him build an altar at the end. We're going to see him enter. We're going to see him exit. We're going to see 150 days uh, uh, at one point and, a, and another 150 days waiting to exit. And all of these build to chapter 8, verse 1, where it says, and God remembered Noah. That's going to be our first point to look at because when we think of God remembering something, it's not the same way as you and I would actually use that same phrase. So let's take a look at the first five verses where we, we get this very important and um, begin the stair step backwards of, of the story, so to speak. Verse 1, Then God remembered Noah and every living creature and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were also stopped. And the rain from heaven was restrained. And the waters receded continually from the earth. At the end of the 150 days, the waters decreased. Then the ark rested in the seventh month, the 17th day of the month, on the mountains of Arat. And the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were, were seen. So again, God re, remembers. Uh, they've already, the earth has been flooded for 150 days. In total, they're on the ark for like a year and 17 days. One writer, Kent Hughes, says, think of it, a five-month lock-in with Mrs. Noah, his three sons, and their three wives in a complete menagerie of the world's animals, birds uh, and crawlers. Five months of stable muck, bilge water, daughters-in-laws and mother-in-law, and seasickness. There must have been times when Noah wished they would hit an iceberg. There's uh, not that this was an easy journey. It's not quite the nursery rhyme story that we picture of this little boat and the giraffe's neck is coming out the window and the rain is just gradually filling things up and so forth. This was a, a very violent uh, storm that took place. And uh, certainly the waters did calm at some point, but it had to be a, a horrific experience. Uh, and during that time, we have no indication that God speaks to Noah at all. In other words, he has the instructions to build whatever transpired after that. Uh, there's instructions. Now it's time to get on the ark and so forth. And during this time, there's a radical storm. There is no reference to God telling Noah, you're doing the right thing. It's going to be okay. Just trust me. You know, he's, he's not pulling out his pocket Old Testament and reading through the Psalms. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he's just having to really just trust the Lord as we do as well. I mean, on, on our side... We do have the scriptures to comfort us when we're going through the storms of life. Sometimes we wish we were really hearing from the Lord a lot more, but it's in those times that he tells us to truly trust him. But we can take comfort from the passages that says, and God remembers. And, uh, and we see this here in verse uh, 15 of chapter 9. The word is used once again, I, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you. In every living creature of all flesh, in both cases, the word remember is used of God fulfilling his promise or his covenant. Uh, stay with me a moment. I want to make what I hope is an important point for us to understand this. Now, in terms of Sodom and Gomorrah and delivering Lot from that situation, uh, as we will get to that in the months ahead, Genesis 19, it says, And it came to pass, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham. And sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. Remember, Abraham was interceding. If there even be ten righteous, will you spare the city? There wasn't. God could have just destroyed it, even based on Abraham's intercession. But he doesn't. 
Why? Because God remembers a promise. Because he remembers a promise, he does something. So the idea of God remembering is much more than when you're at the grocery store trying to remember what it is that you were, uh, you were supposed to get. You know, it's like the guy that uh, uh, said, do you believe in the hereafter? Oh, absolutely. I'm constantly walking into a room and wondering, what am I here after? But um, nonetheless, uh, it, God remembering is very different than, uh, than you or I remember. Think of the classic verse of uh, Exodus 6, 5, where it says, And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. God says, I remember a promise, I keep a promise, and because of that, I'm going to do something now and intercede. God's remembrance is sung about in Psalm 98, 105, and 106. Uh, the prophet Ezekiel it makes reference to it, that God will remember and take us out of this captivity. Uh, and the promise to remember is repeated in the covenant in Sinai in Leviticus 20, 26. So when it says God remembers, it's, it's significance. It means that he is about to do something. When you or I are sitting in that emergency room and it's our child that's in there and we're wondering what the outcome might be or we get the termination notice from our job and we're very concerned about the future and we read a passage in the scripture in the Psalms or somewhere else and it says, and God remembers, it means something. It means that he's thinking about us and how his promises to us apply to our given situation. So it's a lot more than... God didn't have anything else to do. Oh, yeah, that guy Noah down there. What was he up to now? See, it's, it's, not, it's so much more uh, than that. Men also remember in this way, kind of the classic is uh, Joseph when he's in prison interpreting the dream of the butler. And he says to him in Genesis 40, 14, but remember uh, when it is well with you and please show kindness to me, make mention of me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. Remember make mention, take action, do something uh, is the idea. So much more than to recall, it's to retain the thought so that action would take place. In Revelation 19, 11, it makes reference in a sense to God's character in this, where it says, and I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true in righteousness he judges and makes war. Why is Jesus called faithful and true? Because he remembers and he will keep all of his promises. Which leads us to a, a wonderful passage then of, in Luke 23, 42, where the thief on the cross, do you remember what the thief on the cross said to Jesus? I mean, he starts out mocking him just like the other thief. There were no difference. They were guilty. They were being uh, uh, executed that day because of crimes that they had committed against the Roman government, uh, justly so apparently. And, but they mocked Jesus, both of them, but this man watches Jesus and his response, how he deals with those that are persecuting him. Uh, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Uh, the references as he speaks to John about his mother and, and, um, and the way that he is dying. This man basically, like the centurion, realized that truly this man is the son of God. And what does he say to Jesus? Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. There's uh, just lots of wonderful references. I mean, if you're going through a, a hard time, sometimes spiritually or emotionally, just go to a concordance and look up the word remember or God remembered and start reading, uh, as I did this week, uh, tremendously comforting to think about that God remembers and it means he understands and he's going to do something. So God remembered Noah, and for Moses' writing, again, in his literary style, he, that makes the apex, and now he begins down the stair step. But obviously, this is one of the things that Moses is trying to highlight for us in the story of Noah. Verse 6 to 20 continue, as we see uh, Noah remain on the ark and waiting for a sign, waiting to hear from God. So it came to pass at the end of 40 days... Then Noah opened the window of the ark, which he had made. Then he sent out a raven, which, he was, uh, which kept going to and fro until the waters had dried up from the earth. He also sent out from himself a dove to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. 
But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot, and she returned into the ark to him, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and drew her into the ark to himself. And he waited yet another seven days, and again he sent the dove out from the ark. Then the dove came to him in the evening, and behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth. And Noah knew that the waters had receded from the earth. So he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove, which did not return again to him any more. And it came to pass in the six hundred and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, that the waters were dried up from the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked. And indeed, the surface of the ground was dry. In the second month, on the twenty-seventh day of the month, the earth was dried. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and cattle and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him, every animal, every creeping thing, every bird, and whatever creeps on the earth according to their families went out of the ark. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So Noah remains on the ark waiting for a sign. And, uh, and you can imagine there might have been just a little bit of pressure like, can we get off this thing now? In other words, you know, he sends out the raven. Not much happening there, so he waits a while. Again, this all transpires over a total of 54 days, if you kind of track it. Uh, and uh, the dove goes and comes back. The dove comes back with an olive branch, which means now the water has not just receded around them, which apparently it had because they're up on a mountain. And again, how high up they were is difficult. Based on the terrain today, people would estimate it about 13,000 feet. But uh, uh, so the water has receded. I mean, they could go off the ark physically. It was okay, but God hadn't said so. Even when the dove comes back with the olive branch, they don't grow at high elevation olive trees. So that means the water has now receded down on the lower elevations. Now we can get off, Mr. Noah. What do you say? Uh, we've been on here for over a year with these animals. I think today would be a really good day to kick that door down and get out of here. Somebody might have said, I don't really know, but there might have been suggested that they get off the ark. Uh, there might have been a few people that think that was a good idea, and maybe even a few of the animals. But Noah says, no, we're waiting on God. We're not, we're not doing anything until God tells us to move. It's very interesting. Again, the, the environment of the planet, basically, in terms of its animal life, is under his care. If he lets them out too soon, they all drown, something happens to them. Not like they're going to get another shot at it. And, uh, and so he's waiting on the Lord. Uh, just his uh, incredible patience and trust in God is uh, an amazing part of this story. And uh, he does go through this process uh, with the birds, uh, the raven and the dove, but waits for instructions from the Lord. And uh, again, as we think about the military, any of them can tell you that, and that's what you do. <laughs> you, uh, you know, when, you're, when you're engaged, you don't get just to, to decide, I think it would be a good time to do this instead on your own. You always move and you do not move until the orders come. Think of the emotion as they finally get off of the ark, how relieved they would have been, how thankful they would have been, and how grieved they would have been to know that they will never see another person that they ever knew or saw before, that it's all been completely destroyed. But they remain on the ark until it's time to come off and to, to worship. No, notice he builds an altar, and uh, it's important to realize the first thing he thought of was to worship God and to uh, and to give thanks to to the Lord. I just, you know, on a practical point, I would just uh, in, encourage you that, uh, guys, uh, that when these epic events take place uh, in your family, in your lives, at the birth of your son, at, at uh, the son's graduation from high school, uh, at a house, at a car, or at a new job, or whatever it might be, that's when you want to stand up and say, before we do anything else, Let's give thanks to the Lord. You know, there's a real statement being made here in terms of, of the worship. And, and uh, we don't want to miss the idea that what he was doing in terms of these were burnt offerings. And uh, 
We will learn more of what that means later in Leviticus, but that's the offering where everything was consumed on the altar. It was completely gone when it was done. There were fellowship offerings where basically you had a luau with God. I mean, you would, you know, you, part of the animal would be given uh, in sacrifice to God. Part would be cooked right there in the uh, temple or tabernacle area. He would consume part of the animal. You would eat and consume, and it was the closest you could come in terms of fellowship with God. But not with the burnt offering. Everything's concerned, consumed on the altar, and that's what I believe Paul is referring to in, in Romans 12, 1, when he talks about you know, presenting your life as a living sacrifice of complete dedication. And that's what, that's what he does. It's also interesting to consider the fact that there wasn't an overabundance of, of animals at that time. <laughs> but he had taken enough ahead of time, remember, of the clean animals because he knew he wanted to be able to worship God when this whole thing was, was over with. So it's quite a, quite a statement and a great lesson for us. God remembers Noah, and that's important to us because he remembers us and his promises to us, the covenant uh, that we have entered uh, in uh, to him. Uh, remember the new covenant, Jeremiah says, under the new covenant, God says, and I will remember their sins no more. That's, that's an awesome thing. That means God says in the future, there's going to be a new covenant and a new relationship with man under which I will remember their sins no more. But he's got to take action to fulfill now that promise. And of course, that action was sending his son to die on the cross for our sins. So important that God remembers. Noah remains and, uh, and waits for the Lord. That's not always uh, an easy thing to do for us. Uh, the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 40 says, uh, um, again, do you not know, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends, ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. Uh, and he goes on and talks about the fact that even youths grow tired and weary. And young men stumble and fall. But those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will run and not grow weary. They will, uh, you know, walk and not be faint. You know, they will mount up on wings like eagles. So, so often we probably miss out on the strength that God has for us spiritually, maybe even physically sometimes, because we don't do what Noah did here in terms of, because it implies trust, doesn't it? You know, uh, there's a lot of faith and a lot of trust to wait uh, on the Lord, and that's what he does here. He remains and waits for God to provide a sign. The third thing is uh, the Lord's response, and everything kind of turns in the text now. It's all about what God is saying to Noah. Uh, verse 21, and the Lord smelled a s soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, all and day and night shall not cease. So again, from here until chapter 9, verse 17, uh, everything switches from, from Noah's faithfulness to God's response. And, and again, he responds, God does favorably because of Noah's faith. Again, what pleased him about the sacrifice? Was it the smell? Well, the idea of the aroma and God sensing it and so forth is just human language for us to understand that it was accepted. Uh, Noah, again, was considered blameless before God, walking with God. So what's with the, uh, the, uh, the, the sacrifice here? Well, it was a, a way for him to worship the Lord. It was a way for him to acknowledge that uh, there was a bunch of sinners that got on this ark, and there's a bunch of sinners getting off the ark, and it's still going to be by God's grace that we continue in a relationship with him, just as there was... Um, a bunch of sinners that came in that door this morning. There's going to be a bunch of sinners that exit out the other way as they, as they leave. And it's going to be by God's grace that we continue to, to walk with him. Uh, and certainly that's acknowledged in, uh, in the worship that we see here. And the fact that it was accepted by, by God. Not that God was uh, into the animals or into barbecuing or necessarily. But uh, again, it's just the idea of he's accepting what Noah is doing by, by faith. Uh, and so important that uh, we see and acknowledge the sacrifice that we can give that is pleasing to the Lord as well. And the writer of Hebrew uh, tells us at least two of those, 
in Hebrews 13, 15. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So there's at least two and possibly three sacrifices that you and I, there's, there's no need for a sacrifice for sins. Uh, that, that sin, that sacrifice is made once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring us to God, Peter says. Uh, but in terms of when we come and we, we sing, again, when we gather earlier, uh, it's really not just a time for everybody else to be uh, uh, wrapping up conversations before the message or whatever. We're really not doing Christian karaoke in here. Uh, we really are singing uh, to worship the Lord. Because, you know, there's a few people that are so gifted in terms of language that you listen to them pray, uh, and it's, it's just, man, they can just express their, their, their hearts to the Lord. You know, it's just, just awesome. Uh, uh, I had a chance a number of years ago when we were visiting in, uh, in Dallas, Texas, and, and uh, when my uh, brother-in-law and sister-in-law were still living there, and they say, well, what do you want to do when you come to, to Dallas? I go, I'll tell you what I want to do. I want to hear Chuck Swindoll preach in person because he was pastoring the church outside of Dallas, so we found him on the Internet, and we went, and, uh, and it was a great, it was awesome. You know, I'd read so many of his books and seen him on videotape and stuff, but uh, I had never uh, seen him in person before, and uh, he began to uh, pray before he uh, gave the message, and it was so eloquent, and I had to open my eyes. I just had to see, is he reading this? Do people really speak this way? And I did. I opened my eyes, and I looked, and it was funny. When we exited the church later, Shat, my brother-in-law, said, um, did you think he was reading that prayer? Because I opened my eyes, and I looked. So he did the same. His reaction was the same way. Man, can people just really, are they that eloquent? You know, this guy's known as the, the man with a silver tongue, you know, for, for a reason. But a lot of us aren't like that. So songs help us. Somebody else, men and women, like Mark and others, write down expressions of thanksgiving, expressions of faith. Prayers of saying, God, this is what I'd like to do with my life. I want to be faithful to the end. I want to go on, kind of like one of the songs that we sang this morning. And we can kind of just piggyback along and say, yeah, that's what's in my heart, Lord. And when we're doing that and we're speaking to God, praising him, making requests in song, the writer of Hebrews says that God is pleased with that, and that's considered a sacrifice unto him. The other thing that's mentioned here is interesting is, is that uh, forget not to do good and to share. So when we're, when we're simply just being nice to other people, when we're being generous with others, it's a sacrifice unto God if we're doing it with the right motivation. You know, if you're buying your boss lunch so you can get the next holiday off or something, that, that's, not, that's not what we're talking about here. It's not that kind of generosity. It's just kind of the, you know, and we're so fortunate that we, we live in a culture where generosity is just part of the culture. The people here are so naturally giving and open uh, and so forth, uh, and you, you kind of take it for granted. We were talking to one of the, the gals before the uh, first service, and she was talking about visiting, uh, I won't mention where, but a couple of places <coughs> on, on the mainland, and uh, she was just saying, yeah, you know, it's just so, so different, and sometimes you you don't appreciate your own culture until you travel to, uh, to another one. Uh, and we're very blessed in that sense. But when we do it with the right heart, simply showing a simple kindness and being generous, God sees it at a sacrifice to him. And as I mentioned, the passage in Romans 12, it's, uh, it really is to be uh, our lifestyle. Paul there, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies, there it is, a living sacrifice, which is, notice he says, is holy, acceptable to God, and it's a reasonable thing to do. And of course, he's, if you back that up, you know, that, uh, and read the little doxology as Paul's talking about our salvation, he gets overwhelmed and he just starts worshiping the Lord there at the end of, uh, of chapter 12. Uh, and then he, he uh, that's what this is all. This is a, a therefore, <laughs> I, be, I beseech you by the mercies of God. It's a reasonable thing uh, that we would want to 
worship God. So Noah, I mean, after, you know, a, a year <laughs> on this floating thing that's, uh, you know, if you've ever uh, uh, been on a boat, you know, if you get the seasickness, it's not so bad if you're moving. It's when you're dead in the water that uh, re- always gets to me. But uh, to be just bobbing for a year and 17 days, I'm sure then since they got their sea legs under them at some point in time. But it, this was not a pleasant experience. You know, there, even though we said there was room for basketball courts and tennis courts on the ark, I mean, there was room for it. I just don't think they had them. <laughs> and uh, so they, they had a lot of time to occupy themselves over that time. And it would have been like... There's some dry land out there somewhere, honey. Kick that door down. We are out of here. You know, and then once you finally, you got to wait until you hear from God. Are you kidding me? You know, and then it's finally, I'm sure Mrs. Noah really wasn't like that, but uh, just to add to the flavor of things. But uh, they finally get out of there and, uh, and all the animals are exiting. And he says, we're not doing anything else until we worship the Lord. It's pretty, pretty, pretty awesome. And then, uh, and God responds. Notice the, again, as we get into the next chapter in verses 1 to 17, there is the recreation, tempted to say the recreation of the earth, but the recreation uh, of the earth that begins to take place. Verse 9, uh, so God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Uh, excuse me, chapter 9, verse 1. So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the air, on all that move on the earth, that was not there before, and all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hand. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs, but you shall not eat the flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning. And from the hand of every beast, I will require it. From the hand of man, from the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. And as for you, be fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And as for me, behold, I have established my covenant with you and with all your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, and all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. Thus I will establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you. And every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. So again, the recreation of the earth included several commands and I've actually listed five of them here. And of course, some of these are a reiteration of what God said to uh, Adam originally as it's in a sense a recreation. But uh, the first one uh, was there with Adam, be fruitful and multiply or be fruitful uh, in your life and uh, having dominion over the creatures and so forth. So to uh, be reproducing. Uh, We then talked about the idea that, uh, you know, couples that are Christian really should not uh, pray about having children. They should just plan on having children based on this command. Not everyone is uh, is able to, certainly, but uh, there's a direct command because there's going to be something missing in our lives if, uh, if those kids are not there. They are meant to be a great blessing to us. And uh, it's funny that we live in a day when we even need to say this because 
uh, you know, uh, historically for, uh, you know, uh, several thousand years, children were always seen as a great blessing uh, and very significant and very important. Uh, and we've got a culture that kind of, in a sense, goes against that these days, which is tremendously unfortunate. And it's kind of bled over into uh, uh, some Christians' uh, mindsets as well. The second thing is uh, to make these all start with B, be diverse in your diet. I started to say B, be barbecuing, but I wasn't sure how that would look on the uh, PowerPoint, although I think I could have come up with a good picture to go along with it. But uh, apparently, a man was a vegetarian up to this point. Uh, apparently, there was no fear between the animals because they were all vegetarians as well, which helps us understand maybe why they all kind of got along there in the ark going on, although... Obviously, God supernaturally orchestrated that entire event of bringing them on the ark. But at this point, according to God's word, meat was to be a normal part of the human diet. So there's an, an alteration, but an alteration in the uh, animal life as well. They will fear you. In many senses, you'll fear them. Uh, and then this uh, concern about the, uh, the life blood. So there's the uh, be conscious of the blood of the animals. So we would understand this more in terms of the Levitical code under Moses given in the Torah where he would explain because of the animal sacrifices, the blood then becomes significant because it represents that which will turn away the wrath of God. And it's a picture, the life is in the blood, the life is being given, therefore there's a substitutionary death. Your sin is placed on this animal as you lay its head on it, its blood is poured out, your sin is atoned for, it's not taken away, it's simply covered for the time being there on the, uh, on the mercy seat of the Ark of Covenant in the Holy of Holies. That ends up being carried then. It's so in, in, entrenched into man's understanding that it takes a blood sacrifice to turn away the wrath of God, all preparing everyone for this picture of when God would send his own son who would die and it would be his blood that would again be sprinkled on the mercy seat so that the wrath of God would be turned away from us. And uh, very interesting that we see it. It's mentioned here. Uh, and, and again, the other concern is that, yeah, you're going to have dominion over animals. They will be afraid of you at this point. Your relationship would be different. But in a sense, it's like, but don't take advantage of it. Don't just devour animals. Uh, uh, don't, uh, you know, just slaughter animals because you might be able to. So there's a sense of stewardship as well that's being spoken about here in terms of, of animal life. The life is in the blood. God is the giver of life. Don't disregard the gift of life because it's an affront to the person that gives it. God gives life. You destroy it just shamelessly. It's an affront to the person that gives it. You ever give somebody a gift and then they just kind of kick it into the trash? Doesn't make you really want to give them another one, does it? God says, don't do that. These animals, they've got blood in them. That's an indication I've given them life. You keep that in mind because your relationship is going to be different. Uh, the other thing here is to be respectful of human life because it is sacred as well. And again, this is uh, something that we saw early in, in what God says to, uh, to Adam, this idea that every man is made uh, in the image of God, what we refer to as the Imagio Dei, the idea that uh, uh, every person has worth uh, because everybody is made uh, in the image of God. And so God institutes capital punishment. Uh, now you can say you're, you're against capital punishment for a lot of different reasons, maybe economical reasons, but, um, or because of unjust courts and you know, innocent being found guilty and so forth. But you can't say that God uh, is against capital punishment. God is for it. He's, he, uh, he establishes uh, and states it right here. Along with it, then, he says, be diligent, that's the fifth thing, to govern yourselves. In other words, <clears throat> there were sinners that went on that ark. There's sinners that are coming off the ark. And he makes a statement about the fact that <laughs> in your hearts are, are still in that same condition. But I'm not going to judge the earth again. In other words, if it gets out of hand, I'm not going to judge it in the same way. So learn to govern yourselves. So God establishes this idea of civil government, which again, we have then the details of in the Mosaic law, which become the foundation for us in this country 
uh, of our own uh, legal system. But be diligent to govern yourselves. Again, if there's murder, a murderer is going to be dealt with because man is made in the image of God. And uh, with that, I did, uh, as I mentioned earlier, want to read this uh, quote from Chuck Colson. And it was on a Memorial Day of uh, 2002. But uh, he mentions uh, the military, the conduct of the military, and this is a reference to some, something uh, of uh, World War II. But uh, if, you, uh, if you don't know, our, our men and women that are out there fighting today, uh, they, they are so disciplined uh, in what they do, and the rules of engagement are so limited for them. It is amazing what uh, their conduct on the battlefield and what they're able to do and not do and the restraint that they show. Uh, and it makes, again, our military different than uh, any mil military uh, in history. But let me read this quote from, uh, from Colson, a former Marine himself. He says, throughout history, the sight of arms soldiers have always terrified civilians. Soldiers almost always meant an orgy of looting, pillaging, rape, and even murder. That was certainly the case at the end of World War II. Historian Stephen Ambrose, writing in the Wall Street J Journal, notes that at war's end, the most terrifying sight to most civilians was a squad of armed teenage boys in uniform, whether it was the Red Army in Warsaw, the Japanese in Manila, or the Germans in Holland, the sight meant trouble. There was one exception to this tragic rule everywhere in the world, Ambrose writes, whether in France, Belgium, the Philippines, Germany, or Japan, the sight of a 20-man squad of GIs brought joy to people's hearts. Why? Because of the sight of those American kids meant cigarettes, candy, sea rations, and freedom. They had not come to conquer or terrorize, but to liberate. What made those American soldiers so different, even from their European counterparts who shared a common Western and Christian heritage? He's saying American soldiers are uniquely different even from our Western counter counterparts, NATO or anywhere else. It's very interesting what he says here. What made them different was a commitment to and a love for a set of ideals. These were the classic ideas of the American founders. Unlike other nations, America's identity is not based on ethnicity or geography. It is based on a moral proposition. This proposition comes straight from a faded and yellow document, the Declaration of Independence. Quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and all are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among them the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Colson goes on and says, when I went into the Marine Corps, this is what I was willing to die for, and this is what being an American has meant to GIs through the years. The belief, in turn, has shaped the way GIs treated civilians, even in enemy countries. After all, how can you terrorize men and women when you're fighting to protect life, liberty, and every human being? The conduct of our military is predicated upon this passage of Scripture right here, that our founding fathers grasped and became unique to our American ideals. I just thought that was a, such an insightful thing, that what makes us a group of people as Americans is not because we all came from the same place or all spoke the same language or anything else or all looked the same. It's because we held certain ideals to be more important than anything else, and that is we're made in the image of God. So God says here... Better learn how to govern yourselves because I'm not going to bring another flood. And therefore, I'm going to lay down some very basic things that ought to be part of your governmental system. Well, let's go on. The recreation of the earth also included a covenant there in verses 18 and 17. And in terms of, again, a covenant is uh, so important to understand. So much more than a contract. Uh, it doesn't have a date. A uh, covenant is permanent agreement. Uh, and it's not just a set of skills that are pledged it's the, uh, again, conveying of a total being to another person. And uh, God talks about entering into the covenant with, uh, with the earth, with the animals, and with the descendants of Noah here. And they had a sign for the covenant, the, the rainbow. And, of course, we, we maybe sometimes think that apparently there were no rainbows, and suddenly there was a rainbow. And so God says, see that? 
Wow, what's that? I've never seen one of those before. Well, that's going to be the... No, there was probably rainbows. I mean, you have sun, you got moisture in the atmosphere. You probably had rainbows. But uh, God says, see that rainbow? Yes, got it. He goes, from now on, from now on, that's going to be the sign. I will not destroy the earth in the same way and mankind. I will remember, take action uh, in regard to this in terms of my relationship uh, with you. Again, it's a covenant of mercy I'm not going to get, no, should have mankind been destroyed again after that? Or has everybody been like really good after the flood? Oh, I don't want that to happen again. We're also going to worship the Lord, walk with God, be kind to one. And it's been that way ever since, right? No, actually, the, the, God, God in his justice could have destroyed mankind in this world many times over. There could have been Noah 2, 3, 4, and 5, and 6. Probably due for one about every 75 years or so. But God says, I'm not going to do it again. You might get a little nervous about that. So when you see that rainbow, you'll remember that uh, that's the sign of this agreement. And for us, again, the signs of the covenant become important because we remember that God remembers. He takes action and fulfills his promises to us. And that's why when we take communion, we hold up and then take the signs of the new covenant promised by Jeremiah in Jeremiah 31, that God would remember our sins no more. The signs, Jesus said, are going to be the cup representing his blood and the bread, the matzah, representing his body that was broken for us. A couple of things just to uh, review very quickly is uh, the flood considered prophetically again. They going into the ark in the same way pictures us going into a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's what brought atonement. It's what... Uh, kept away the wrath of God from them, uh, and also the idea of the, uh, the lessons from, from Noah, that uh, during, during that time, he was certainly being a consi consistent witness for, for God as we should be uh, prophetically. Jesus said that in the days of Noah, so, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be, not when, uh, when somebody uh, on CNN says it's going to happen, but uh, when uh, he's ready to come himself. But again, think about the parallels. There's uh, in the days of Noah, we've mentioned some of them, a population explosion based on chapter one, uh, chapter six, verse one, moral corruption of every kind, violence, the expansion of arts, industry, and technology. We saw that back in chapter four, verse 16, a lack of conscience even for murder and true believers growing more and more and more into the minority. So all of those things will be indicators that we're close to the coming of the Son of Man. And then the, the flood practically. One is that God must punish sin, and he, uh, he will do that. And this, when you see that rainbow, it should remind us of God's not going to judge the way he did, but he did judge, and he will judge again in the future. Two, God gives warnings, but eventually his patience will wear out and judgment will come. Three, God always saves people in the same way, by his grace through faith. And four, a true witness demands separation from sin. No one his family kept themselves unspotted from the world. Uh, and it's, uh, it's very difficult, uh, you know, when we love friends and families and neighbors, and we want to be able to share the gospel with them. They're going through a time when maybe there's difficulty in their life and maybe they're a little more open to the gospel. But my life hasn't really represented what the gospel should do in a person's life. Sometimes when we say what we do is over here and what we say is over here and there's a gap in between and we call that gap credibility. And the wider that gap, the less we actually can speak into someone's life. Uh, the, there's, I can just tell you is, uh, you know, I knew enough growing up in the church, uh, even though I wasn't, uh, wasn't saved, I knew enough that I would see people get involved in, in cults, uh, in different groups, or just go through horrific things, and I couldn't really say a word to them. I mean, I kind of knew what to say, but I knew it would fall on deaf ears because I wasn't living it myself. <laughs> how, could I, how could I tell them they had to walk with God? They had to pray to God. They had to turn to God. I never turned to him myself. So there's a, we don't want that credibility gap. Uh, there's people around that uh, need the love of God. Like Noah and his family, we need to lessen that credibility gap. A true witness demands separation from sin. Uh, and then lastly, as we saw with the sons of God, 
uh, and the again these alien de demoniac creatures that they brought forth that God condemns compromise and rebellion but he rewards a separated saint Noah, Noah's an awesome guy isn't he and his uh, and his family went through it's just uh, it's just amazing you know and again as we said last week you can you know, God, God may not call, call us to build an ark, but he calls us to build a lot of stuff, and certainly our lives, and, uh, and he wants to work in and through our lives because there is a judgment coming, and he does allow us a, a time period when we can tell people about that, but there's a way to be saved out of it in the, in the way that Noah was. And uh, as we looked at the, looking at the life of Jeremiah on Wednesday night, we're, we, we said that uh, fortunately God, God doesn't pay on commission. He pays on salary. You know, commission is if you, you know, you get something, you know, some, you, you produce some results, then, then you, you get a check, right? You sell something, you get a check. But uh, salary is you just get the check every week whether you actually, you know, produce anything or not. And as Christians, we're, we're on salary. We're not on commission. In other words, we're just like Jeremiah. How many people did Jeremiah save? Well, maybe the scribe Barak, and that, that was maybe it. Everybody else gets wiped out in the end. Faithful guy for 40 years. You know, Noah, it's just his family. You know, don't, don't be discouraged, uh, you know, and weary in well-doing. You know, in due time, you will reap a, a harvest, uh, the writer of Hebrews says. So uh, continue to be a strong witness for Jesus Christ because there is a judgment that is coming, and, uh, and we need to... Be reminded of it sometimes and the reality of what it will be like as well as the reality to be with the Lord for all eternity. Given you my heart.